You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors, you're not paying monthly hosting fees, the sound quality is great, the distribution is phenomenal. Friends, download the free Anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started. Remember, you heard it here first on Mysterious Goings On. Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. This is Alex Greenwood, your host. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I know it's been a while since our last show, but as I'm fond of saying, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. I think John Lennon coined that one. Lots of things been going on. Not going to bore you with it now, because straight ahead we have an interview. I'm just really excited to get an interview with Scott Mickelson also known as Mickelson, who is one of the hottest indie musicians on the scene today. He was Grammy balloted for his last album called Flickering. He has done a lot of incredible stuff. And we're going to get to Scott in just a moment. I wanted to catch you up on a couple of things with me. Just a reminder that uh, the sixth book in the John Pilot Mystery Series is in production. I'm working on finishing it up and getting it to my editor now. And I'm hoping for a Halloween release for Pilot's Rose. If you're new to the series, I picked up some new readers recently who said they really like it and they bought the entire series. And I can, can prove they did it because I sold it to them. If you're listening to this show and you're enjoying this series, I, I appreciate you you reading. And I'm, I'm excited to tell you that you'll have yet another edition of The Adventures of John Pilot in your hot little hands with by, by Halloween. So let's, let's shoot for that. Only a year late. What's the big deal, right? I'm excited to tell you that. And then after that, I've got some plans to move away from John Pilot for a little while. But um, not forever, but for a while. But uh, we'll talk about that in a different show. Because today, we're lucky to have San Francisco-based musician, artist, producer, singer-songwriter Mickelson on the show. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Scott before we get started, because when I had Scott, he didn't have a lot of time and we had to jump right in. He's on tour. He had done a state here in Kansas City after doing some dates in Chicago and I think Minneapolis and Omaha and a few other places. But anyway, we were really lucky to get him and talk to him. And I was I think you'll find his insights into the creative process. Uh, even if you're not a musician, interesting. If you're a writer, I think you'll find some parallels here. And Scott, incidentally, he doesn't mention in the interview, he, he did write a popular children's book a few years ago. Um, but he uh, he focuses his time now on being a singer-songwriter and producer. And he has a new album he's going to drop, which you're going to hear about. And there's really cool. I have a version of one of the songs on the album that we're going to get to play in the interview. And Scott has cautioned me that this is probably going to get tweaked a little bit before the album comes out this fall. So it's a real treat for Mysterious Goings On listeners to uh, get a chance to listen to Scott's uh, uh, or part of Scott's album. It'll be a little kind of little piece of history there considering that it's not uh, not the final, final, final version. If you want to know more about Scott, go to Mickelson. That's M-I-C-K-E-L-S-O-N music.com. You'll find his bio there, but uh, I'll just give you a little, little hint of that before we get to the interview. Through a career that spanned five full-length releases with his band Fat Opie, a struggle with a long-term illness, and a career as a fine artist, Scott Mickelson has persevered. And with his debut solo release, Flickering, Mickelson delivers his most critically acclaimed work. Of course, he's got a new one coming, so we'll see. Mickelson is singing the stories of those living their lives in contemporary America as fragmented as it is. Flickering was on the 2015 Grammy ballot in two categories, Best Folk Album and Best Roots Music Performer. Scott is... 
well deserving of that, and I I foresee Scott eventually getting uh, getting that Grammy. But uh, I don't want to jinx him any, and he's probably listening to this and rolling his eyes and wanting to reach through the uh, through his iPhone or whatever and, and punch me for saying that. But I really think he's he's just that good. And I had I had the rare uh, treat of being able to listen to his new album that is coming out this fall. He had just mastered it. I know he's going to tweak it a little bit, but I basically got to hear the entire album and I was blown away. So anyway, you can find out a whole lot more about Scott on his website at MickelsonMusic.com. But right now, why don't we hear from the man himself, ladies and gentlemen, my interview with Mickelson. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so new album coming out. Yes. Let's get right to it, shall we? Okay. It's a wondrous life, is that right? A wondrous life, yes. Uh, it's a line in the opening track. Um, it's a, For me, it's a bit of a departure because a lot of my songs have talked to a lot about struggling and, and persevering. And um, with this record, I feel like um, things are going much better in my life and it's a little more optimistic. And um, even though it's, it's slightly tongue-in-cheek, um, I thought that was a, uh, a, good, a good new approach for this next cycle of my career. Well, it's interesting. I'm a big fan of Flickering, your last album, which got you on the Grammy ballot. Mm-hmm. Uh, congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Who knows what this will bring? Let's, let's not try to jinx it, though. Yeah. But, but uh, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of that sound of yours, which is so distinctive. And I've been privileged to get to listen to about 99% of the new or 95% or whatever of the new album. And, you know, no bullshit here. I love it. It's great. But it's... Thank it, you. It's, in, it's a... But it, it's... I don't want to call it a departure because it's still you, but it's not what I expected. And it's got a rock edge to it that I didn't expect. Am I on the right? Yeah, side? you are. I mean, I... Uh, the, you know, music I was doing uh, in the in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, I was definitely an alt-rock artist uh, with a band. And so... People who've known me for a long time um, will see some similarities, and uh, but yeah, I um, you know I I don't go into any new record with a preconceived notion of what the production is going to be. I just kind of uh, start doing my thing uh, with the songs, and in this case, on the last record uh, on Flickering, I had been writing with and for a band for so long um, that. For Flickering, it was the first time I could just work with any musicians I wanted and just open up the production to doing anything I wanted uh, without having to worry about, you know, having parts for the bass player and the other people in the band. So I worked with close to 25 different musicians on uh, Flickering, whereas with this one, um, I decided I wanted to try to play almost all of it myself. And mostly, it's not like an ego thing. A lot of it was that I, because I'm working, I'm very busy as a producer now, I have a limited time on when I can work on my stuff. So the idea of, I was thinking, trying to get scheduled more singers and other people, I just, in the time it would take me to schedule it, if I had a couple hours, I could just lay it, you know, so, and I like the, the technical challenge. And uh, so I use the drummer named Frank Rayner, who, I played with in the 80s, believe it or not, and uh, he's the best drummer I've ever worked with by far. He used to, uh, he was Scott Weiland's drummer, and he's played with all kinds of people. Oh, wow. and yeah. So I was playing a show in LA, and I asked if I could crash at his house that night, and uh, I realized, you know, he, he has a drum studio. I mean, that's what he does for a living. So I said, well, I'm here. Why don't we play a couple tracks? And then I flew him up, and he laid all the tracks. So that was just really great um and it, it set such a great foundation for the record and then uh, the only other artists i have playing on it are the musicians i have dennis anetta who played uh, on uh, electric guitar on flickering and, and he's been playing with me live for the last couple of years he's a good friend and then i had uh, a piano player who i've used in the studio for other clients do a couple of piano tracks for stuff that was more like uh like real piano playing, <laughs> oh! But uh, I, I play all the piano on the other stuff. But uh, when I do the line of notes, you'll know the two that he does. And then, of course, I didn't play horn. So on one song, there's a, a trombone and and tuba, which are both played by Luke Curley, who I used on Heads Too Small, 
on flickering. Yeah, on flickering, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love how you're not afraid to go to those forbidden instruments, you know. I mean, you play the banjo. You have tuba, trombone. I mean, the, the, that's not, not the usual fair. I guess. I mean, I guess in New Orleans it is, you know. I mean, I just, like I said, it's I just grab what, what I want to use at the time. I don't, on flickering, I wrote, I think nine, seven or seven, eight of the tracks I think were written on banjo and the other other ones on guitar were on this one. I think there's only two banjo songs and the rest is I wrote on uh, guitar. So it's yeah. different. I think that's why I took a, that away. That there was a more of a rock edge to it because yeah. there's it's more like you're sprinkling some banjo into this one rather than leading with the banjo. Yeah. Is that fair to yeah, say? Yeah, the songs I have the banjo, I wrote from the banjo. Yeah. It was never a, a, an afterthought. Um, and also, I think uh, because I've, I've been producing so much since Flickering and having to do electric guitar on my clients' records, um, I, guess, I guess got... I guess interested in playing more electric guitar. I, you know, I, I do like doing it. I just don't do it that often. Uh, but I certainly like tracking it and, and uh, arranging, you know, electric guitar. Yeah. So. Well, uh, from a, cre a creative standpoint, that's one of one of the reasons we're excited to have you on the on the podcast here. But from a creative standpoint, um, I, I, I'm always curious, and um, pardon me if it's a little hackneyed of a question, but. Um, it's okay. You're from the Midwest. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, by the way, we're rec we're recording this at my uh, my home in Kansas City because Scott's been touring uh, Chicago and uh, Omaha and a few Madison, places. Yeah. yeah. So, but I was going to ask. Uh, I I know a lot. You get this kind of question a lot, but just because uh, a lot of our listeners are really into the creative process, that so is it lyrics first? Is it is it is it is it music first? Does it change? For, for me, it's always music first, and um, I usually work out some some riffs or chord progressions on an instrument and then start sc screaming out melodies and when i feel like i have a, a melody and a and a, a chordal progression that's working i go into whatever notes i've scavenged and collected and um i don't really sit there and say i'm going to write a song about this or a song about that i i I liken it to being a, it's like a collage. I just collect a lot of words and phrases and ideas and scratch them on pieces of paper. And then when I get ready to actually stop penning a song, I just look at these pieces of paper on my desk or on the floor and try to collage some elements together and see if I can, you know, sew together some kind of a story out of it. And that's, that's how I've been doing it for 25 years. I mean, even a fortune cookie or something? Anything. It yeah. could be from anything. Because yeah. there's a line we were talking about offline uh, in, I'm sorry, which song was that? Uh, where the, the tongue is the heart of a fool. Which oh, is, the tongue is... Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, there was a book of Chinese right. proverbs. There's a, I, I took... Uh, on Flickering, there's that song... Um, the one that has the Arabian feel, the Middle Eastern feel. Uh, 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 shoot. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a couple of lines... In that song, that were from the same day. I was I was mixing, flickering, in tiny telephone studios in San Francisco, and you know, like in the the bathroom or somewhere <laughs> that they had a book of Chinese proverbs. So I scratched them down. But yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. In in I think uh, your listeners, even and I. It's interesting because there's some people who they don't really listen to the lyrics, which surprises me because well, of course I'm a writer, so I'm into the lyrics big time. But I, I have friends who are like, oh, I don't listen to lyrics. I don't, I don't bother with them. But the, I think the listeners who check out Scott's work will note that um, there not only are there lush melodies and, and and these wonderful layers of musicianship that are fantastic, but the, the lyrics are right there with it. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I am confessing to be fascinated by your process because you say to me. I start with music, but then all this, but to me, I'm sitting here hearing it, and I'm going, no, no, no. He surely had this idea for this song, these lyrics. He wanted to say something, but that's totally not it, huh? No, no. And as a matter of fact, I don't. Uh, a lot of times, I really don't know what the song is about till much, much later. And, and when I, I usually, it takes me a while to even figure out how to introduce a song, you know, as to what it's about, because I'm still trying to sort it out myself. Um, so. Yeah, that's. Does it does it does a song continue to have a life uh, as you tour? Does it change at all when you play, or do you pretty well keep it? 
keep it the same? Um, I uh, I may change phrasing, and you know, by the time I play any new song live, I've I've probably played it 40, 50 times at home just to memorize it, and uh, I don't really think I change it that much. Um, no, I, I don't think I rewrite things. Yeah. yeah. How does your work as a producer inform? your work as an artist yourself. Do you pick up things by helping other artists? Absolutely. Can you give me an example of something like that? Well, I, I mean, every every artist you work with or musician just a hired player, they, if you're not learning something, there's always something you can learn. It's um, whether it's learning how to deal with something musically, how to how, how to communicate something in, in words that apply to anybody's skill level. I, mean, I don't read or write music, so if I have to explain to uh, a horn player or a drummer what I want, I have to be able to articulate these things. And um, so I've had to learn from other people what, what, what they need for me to be able to communicate that. And, and there's also a lot of psychology. And also, um, I really challenged my clients as songwriters. We, you know, we spent a lot of time developing their songs before we ever record anything. Oh. Just with just the basic guitar or piano and vocal and lyrics and really make the song work. And, and I won't record anything until the song works. And every time I help somebody rewrite a song, it's it definitely it's because I can't just make it the way I want to do it all the time. I have to appreciate what they're doing with their song. And uh, so I learn, you know, instead of me always going back to the same toolbox that I always use, it's, you know, putting different tools in the box to work from. So it's I'm always learning something. Yeah. You can get very set set in your ways. And, <laughs> and if you don't um, if you don't get in the way of yourself, you'll just become better at what you do. Is there, is there, a, is there a type of music that doesn't interest you? That you is there a genre you 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 or maybe a better question might be: Is there a genre of music that you haven't really explored that you want to? Maybe that's a better question. Um, I think I'd like to. I haven't I haven't produced a, a full band in a while. I've been working mostly with solo artists, and uh, it'd be nice to work with a band a little bit more. Uh, even if it's tracked individually, because um, a lot of what I've been doing is I've had to build all the rhythm sections and mm. basically everything. Right. So it'd be nice to you know find a band that has the songs somewhat hashed out and the arrangements somewhat hashed out, and then push that a little further. And so I think that would be a nice thing to do. Yeah. Do you think that also might involve psychology again? Would it's you, all psychology. Is, is the producer's role also kind of with a full band as referee as well? Uh, it's everything. Yeah. It's it's all. I mean, it's. It, I would say eighty percent of it is psychology, <laughs> and I. Uh, it's you know you got to be really careful because we're all sensitive, you know. And uh, and I, I've been on the other side when being produced and been you know offended and and hurt, and so I try to be uh, thoughtful about that. Right. But uh, yes, there's psychology in bands. I mean, I, I was producing a band in L.A. a few years ago who was on a, a Aslan Records. And it was actually a, a Latin jazz band, a bunch of 20-year-old know-it-alls. Um, <laughs> Aren't they all? And uh, the piano player and the drummer used to tour with the Beastie Boys, so they, they were very confident. But they had never recorded in a 24-track recording studio, and they, they were great live, but they had not had the uh, the experience of of doing it in the studio so that was really trying and you you find uh, at least in that situation you know one player saying something to you and another player saying and they're like using you as the hub right you know so it's um yeah it's fun i mean uh, it's it but a lot of it is psychology and also a lot of it is making the artist just feel comfortable and confident in order to get them to do their best performance you know a lot of singers who haven't sung a lot, um, you know, they hear what they hear themselves and they hear the pitchiness and they, they hear issues or they, they've never harmonized with themselves or, or you know, and it's, you, you want them to feel like they can do it. You know, we, you can do it just because you haven't done it or maybe it might take a few times you'll get it. And there's a lot of that or, um, especially with, when it comes to lead vocal tracks, uh, uh, singer songwriters who have been used to, singing things the same way this is how i've always sung it and this is how i sing it and 
And then in my ears, I'm hearing it for the first time. And if something always sounds off or wrong or clumsy, you know, it's my job to make it sound more like a wreck and make it more fluid. And um, it can be very challenging for a singer to all of a sudden sing something differently and, and learn, learn it a new way. So th- those kinds of things need to be handled very uh, cautiously. Sure. You know, I think this would be a great time. You've uh, been kind enough to let me uh, play a track, right, mm-hmm. on the show. What, what are we going to, why don't you introduce the track for me real quick? Crazy is the only place for a saint. Yeah. All right. All right. That's coming up. And that's, uh, we're going to play uh, Crazy is the only place for a saint from A Wondrous Life by... Just it's, Mickelson. It's Mickelson. Yeah. Yeah. Not, and he's not the golfer. Mickelson. We'll be right back after the song. Give it a listen.
Wow, Scott, I really, that's one of my favorite. I mean, you're, you're being kind. You're letting me basically pick because that's the one I really like. Uh, I like them all, but uh, that track really, uh, I heard you play it live uh, first, obviously, and then I got to hear the produced version. And, and I'm one of the first people to hear this, this, this mastered album, so that one really sticks with me. And I, uh, congratulations on a fantastic uh, piece of work. Oh, thanks. How long yeah, did it take you? To make the record? Yeah. Um, from the actual writing of the songs, kind of began after flickering, so three years. Is that about your average? Uh, it's usually two years, but I got so busy producing other records that it really slowed down me doing mine. Right. And I do find it really hard to, if I'm completely immersed in other people's records, it really does slow me down writing. It really cuts into it. Yeah. Um, I was doing a record in 2015 and I just didn't write anything the whole time because I was working with one artist all the way through his record. And as soon as that record was done, I wrote half of these songs like very quickly. So it's hard for me to, it's only so much brain space, oh, you know? And uh, yeah. I mean, I'm at the point now where I need to really start writing my next record because I'm already, I've been working on these for years and performing them. So, I mean, solo, but not with the band yet. Well, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you're busy, you've got a lot of things going on, but I wanted to ask you just about one side of the business of the trend. And that's the thing that a lot of our writers who listen to the show will be interested in. There are parallels, uh, for example, um, we're both, uh, I'm an indie author, you know, you for all intents and purposes, indie musician. And um, so that means we are also our own publicist, our own, um, well, you know, you work, you, you, you um, produce your own stuff, right? So, uh, yeah, engineer and producer, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I have an editor, of course, for me, because, uh, so that, that kind of has that role for me. And right. my editor is good enough to tell me when something really sucks, so that's important. But but I was going to, the only thing I can liken to touring is, of course, doing a book tour, which I've done a limited a couple book signings, things like that, and just gave me a taste of what it must, how horrific a real full-fledged book tour must be, mm -hmm. going city to city and standing behind a, sitting behind a table and signing and then reading and, yeah, that sounds awful to me. So, uh, I, I'm curious about the state of music today. So, you tour mm -hmm. to make a living, correct? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say uh, I made almost 50-50. Half of my income was from touring and half was from producing. Uh, but I think this year it's going to be more on the producing side, at least the way it looks now. Well, is, it, is, it, is the business changing from when you first started? Well... From when I first started, there used to be a record business. There isn't a record business anymore, yeah. so it's really changed. There people don't buy records anymore, so there's not, uh, there's there is no record business. It's really changed. It's all it's all Spotify. Yeah. So um, yeah, I used to. If you couldn't make uh, a lot of money off of uh, off of club doors and that kind of thing, uh, you could bank on uh, merchandise and selling CDs and things like that and. Um, no one buys CDs because it's a dead medium at this point. So you, know, you hope people buy T-shirts and other things. And it's just really, uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen the contrast between last year and this year. Uh, people are buying much less even for the most part. Hmm. Um, Is that a cycle or, or are, you, are you worried that it's a trend? Um, I, I, I know it's a tr I know it's because people... Look at your cars, look at your computers. No one's buying CDs. There's no CD players anymore. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I'll, I'll do some vinyl and, you know, there are downloads. Uh, but again, why would anyone want to buy music if they can just hear anything they want at any time for free on Spotify? So, um, I think that's that was the last nail in the coffin uh, for the music business, personally. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Um and people still need to make music and there are still production costs. And fortunately for me, I can make my own, but there are still mastering costs and other costs involved. And uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like you used to make uh, your CDs and after you sold the, the first 10% of them, you've covered your costs or whatever. Right. That, those principles don't really hold up anymore, at least in, in my world. So uh, going forward though, you, you have no plans to stop. Right, you're gonna. This is what you do, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to quit for <laughs> since I was 17. So. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. I really am. I. Uh, do you have another tour lineup? Or as we're speaking now, it's uh, early August 2017. So uh, I know you're just getting back off a kind of a short tour. Are you gonna tour again anytime soon, or what are you gonna do? I think. Um, I have uh, a couple of dates in October and 
in November, one in the, in the Northwest and in, in the Southwest. I'm not sure if I'm going to turn those into tours. Right now, I'm a little tired, and um, I need to, when I get back to San Francisco, I need to uh, make a, a couple of videos and do my album art and kind of, you know, I have a, my record release show in November. So I need to kind of stay local and and focus on all the other elements that go along with the new record. And also I have a, a lot of clients who have been patiently <laughs> waiting for me to mix their music and, and do their stuff. So, yeah, I, I the way I'm feeling at the moment, I'm not dying to uh, get on the road in the very near future, yeah. unless a, a great opportunity comes along. But, uh, yeah. you know, I've done a lot. The last five years I've been really touring a lot and uh, yeah <laughs> yes, yeah yeah he's uh he's got he's got the fatigue going that's for sure guys uh hey scott this is great where can people find you and your music online and everywhere um mickelsonmusic.com and that is my website and then from there there's links to everything uh the new record the way it looks now i'll be releasing it in november but um, I'm not really sure. I think the best thing to do is uh, uh, check my website. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, the traditional thing of I'm going to put it on iTunes and now it's released. Uh, I'm going I'm to think a little bit more on how and what releasing a new record is these days. So I, I am going to do vinyl, though, just because my brother wants one. So. Well, that's, <laughs> I, I think I might want to get one. Too. Yeah, so I'll do some of those. But um, I'm, I'm actually thinking I might just do flash drives. You know, that have all the downloads for all my records and the artwork and the lyrics. And, uh, well, that's a clever idea. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, t shirts. And, yeah. well, you can find Scott again at Mickelson, and that's M I C K E L S O N music.com. The links will be in the show notes. Uh, so if you don't want to, if you're driving, don't stop the car and write it down. Don't worry about that. Yeah, but again, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I could talk for a lot longer, I could tell you, but that he's got to go to some things, and uh, we're just excited to have had you here, Scott. Thank oh, you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. It, it was my pleasure. And remember, he uh, the album is called Wondrous Life. It'll be out uh, this fall. Just stick, a, stick around his so, uh, social media. You're also on Facebook. and uh, yeah, Facebook, yeah. Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, if you go to my website, it's all it's those all links are on the front page. Yeah, and remember, this this guy was on the Grammy ballot for the, the previous album, uh, Flickering, which is fantastic. For He was up for Best Folk Album and Best Roots Music Performance. So, uh, you know, this, guy, this guy's got some cred. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the song. And thanks again, Scott, for letting us play it of and uh, I think I think uh, uh, if we can I just play out a snippet with a, another song can we just, sure. not the whole song just a snippet yeah which um, one do you think would be good a lot of people like no such luck it's the uh, yeah. s I think it's the second track on the record mm -hmm. and kind of an upbeat tongue-in-cheek thing about uh, how we tend to bite off more than we can chew and keep ourselves in a, a state of distress for no reason <laughs> that sounds familiar that sounds really familiar well that's great okay well this is uh on our way out uh, thanks again uh by the way just a little note to my listeners here sorry i've been away for a while um i'm busy working on pilots rose the next book in the series and that'll be out hopefully by halloween uh, more on that later this is scott mickelson and uh until next time keep reading
rate on everyday purchases and a place to transfer high interest rate balances. The PenFed Gold Contactless Card is our lowest interest rate credit card. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Join PenFed and together we can help you keep more of what's yours. Visit PenFed.org slash gold card. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. Get a credit card that gives you what you need now a low interest rate on everyday purchases, and a place to transfer high interest rate balances. The PenFed Gold Contactless Card is our lowest interest rate credit card. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Join PenFed and together we can help you keep more of what's yours. Visit PenFed.org slash gold card. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA.